What if that nagging feeling in the back of your neck was real? What if those hands reaching out from the dark that you believed were there, were there? What if the monster in the basement really existed? And what if there was really something under the bed? Would you have the courage to face your fears? The change was quite slow, now that I think about it. That's why I wasn't surprised when I lost the family home in the fire, with the family inside. It was tragic, yes, and it took more than a while to pick myself up from the ground, but I think the anticipation helped me cope. It started with the black helicopters. Abe Loveless, who was the PM before mob rule broke out, had ordered a complete shutdown of all borders, but it was no use. Canada, Scotland, Nepal, and China all did the same thing and failed. Even North Korea had fallen into the infection before us. We hoped that Australia would have an advantage, being an island country. But over the course of three years, we couldn't hold the infection off. However, it really wasn't the disease that destroyed us. It was the riots, mobs, and mass hysteria. If someone came down with something as trivial as hay fever, the mob would have grabbed them and thrown them in the river anyway. After a while, Tasmania lost contact with the outside world. News station burned, planes crashed, and ships sank. At that point came an age which was comparable to the Lord of the Flies. Civil rule took over. Three good people stood above the crowd, trying to bring peace and order to save the lives of their friends and family. Their throats were promptly slit. Then. They inevitably woke up, after three hours slumber, out for blood. Zombies. Before the Zompocalypse, zombies were just a part of myth and legend, which constantly appeared in film, books, and video games. People were obsessed with them. But now all we want to do is escape their decaying grasps. Our once population of 500,000 fell to 300,000 after the first riots. That's when I lost my family. Three hours later, they climbed from the rubble, blackened by fire and reddened by blood. The population fell again to 150,000. After our first year alone, the population continued to fall. People weren't accustomed to the tribal life in Tasmania, which was previously a hub of inhumanity, had degraded to a hub of savagery. It became a cause of celebration when you recognized someone from your old life, even if they didn't recognize you back. I'm sorry to break it to you, but my last friend, Sam, didn't make it past 25 years of age. I lost him four years ago. We went on a supply run at an old abandoned grocer's. It had gone untouched during the riots because it was buried under the depths of a rural village. Through an obscure alley and a flight of stairs under the ground, it was filled with rotten fruits and meats, but there were one line of shelves at the back where they were lined with enough preservatives to feed the whole lodge. Hey, Sam. Do you remember alphabet soup? I asked, picking another can from the shelf. Because that still exists. I hate alphabet soup, he cringed. You're a monster, I snapped, hugging the can. Besides, you can't afford to be picky. Fine, he said, snatching a jar of preservative olives from the shelves. I dare you to eat one of these. He knew I feared olives more than death itself. I opened my satchel, placing the alphabet soup in it, and stared at the olives with cautious eyes. Okay, I replied, reaching out for them, when we get back. I'm not going to forget, Sam said, as I placed the olives in my satchel. Later we began to walk up the store, when something caught Sam's eye. No way, he gasped. What? I asked, absentmindedly turning to see what he was looking at. He jumped over the store counter and stepped over the corpse of the owner. Check it, he grinned from ear to ear picking a strangely shaped black bag from under the shopkeeper's desk. What is it? I asked. Yes! He laughed, ignoring me. It's not empty. He unzipped the bag to pull out a saxophone. I haven't played in years, he gawked. I lost mine in the fire. Oh. My hand tightened around my satchel. I wouldn't put my lips on that. No, I'm not going to. I had a box of old reeds hidden somewhere, he said, putting the saxophone back in the bag and gracefully sliding over the counter and I'm going to look around for some disinfectant. Sam, I groaned. Why would you need that when we have a perfectly good rusty trombone at base? Pfft, he scoffed. 
He climbed through the aisles and finally lifted a purple box of disinfectant into the air. We got to the base just before sunset. Base was originally a tourist lodge, and it was constructed as a safe haven by the last tourist in Tasmania, an American named Jacob Sampson. He was a bit of a genius before the Zompocalypse. It would have been called a gated community, but now ungated communities didn't exist, making the word gated redundant. Sam and I settled into our pad and sat around, waiting for Sam to clean his new saxophone. Oh no, I said as he sat down, smiling wildly. This is going to be a nightmare. Just sit back, he said, and let the music take you away. I sighed and stood up. All right, but I'll listen for you from the other room. I moved into the kitchen, opened up a cold can of beans, sat down to eat and attempted to finish the book I was reading. I didn't know why I kept torturing myself, even if the author was still alive. There was no way I was going to get the last book of the series. After an hour passed, I leaned back to ask Sam why it was taking him so long to tune the saxophone. He merely scowled, saying, It is tuned. Later on, I crept into bed, blowing out the lantern on my nightstand. The night had settled around me. I could hear the crickets chirping outside and a group of lodgers chatting far in the distance. The night was icy, but the years had acclimatized me to sleeping in the cold. It didn't take long for sleep to embrace me, but I was awakened by Sam knocking at my door. Three slow and steady knocks. Travis! He was breathing heavily and painfully forcing his words out. Sam? I asked, jumping out the bed and stepping through the, the room. Let me in, he mumbled. What do you want? I asked, sliding the latch along the door. I am hungry. My heart jumped into my throat. There's food in the kitchen, I called through the door. I'm so hungry, Travis, he slurred. Let me in, I'm starving. I slid the latch back into place and backed away from the door. Sam, you better not be joking, I said, backing toward my bedside table and reaching inside for my knife. Give me food, please. I flicked a match and lit my lantern, lifting it above me and stepping towards the door. I heard Sam furiously scratching at the wood. Sam, try to control yourself, I said, sliding the latch open and stepping back. The door handle rotated, and the door swung inwards. Sam stood in the doorway, staring at me. His eyes were shrouded by his brow. His fingernails were bloody from scratching the door. Beads of sweat were falling from his forehead, and his breathing was deep and heavy. His feet padded along the ground as he lumbered toward me. Sam, you got three seconds to get out of here, or I'm going to kill you. He froze in his spot and looked up at me. His lips were blue, and his right eye was a long strand of mold blooming from it. His left eye was blood red. He snarled and ran straight into my knife. It drove its way into his chest, crunching through his sternum and tearing into his heart. His teeth gnashed my ear, so I pushed him back. Once he was far enough away, I kicked him back. He collapsed to the ground, writhing and choking. I jumped onto him and brought the knife down, driving it into his skull. A warm torrent of blood climbed up the knife and bathed my hands. The red pool expanded beside him until his struggling stopped, and he finally died. I could feel my eyes tearing up. The stench was unbearable. A deep, stinging sensation filled my limbs and the back of my throat, a feeling of panic. I looked down at his corpse, which was frozen still, and out of the corner of his mouth I spotted it, jammed to the backside of his cheek and covered in brown, sticky blood. It was the reed of the saxophone. 